Hi, my name's Lena, I'm a freelancer, and I don't get screwed over anymore. Welcome to my channel if you haven't been here before. I make videos about social change and books. I'm also somebody who's been working in the publishing industry for the last eight years. I moved to London from the Midlands knowing almost no one and started freelancing on the side almost immediately. I thought I'd compile a list of things that I wish I'd known. I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning, I embarrassed myself a little bit, I screwed up a few projects and also I was screwed over quite a lot. It was through the generosity of others slowly widening my networks and through a combination of grit and privilege that I have these tips for you today. I wanted to put them out there on the internet for free for anyone to find because God knows on top of any systemic or personal issues you may be facing when it comes to getting freelance advice. Advice. Our global pandemic never helped anyone. Finding your people, finding your peers uh, in your industry is really key and that's where I've learned all of this knowledge from and it's been absolutely invaluable. But I sure wish I had seen this video eight years ago. So let's just beam this video backwards, shall we? I have 13 points to make, so let's get going. 13 is the lucky number in this case because you make your own luck when it comes to freelancing. Right, let's hop on. The first one and the most key one before you even think about freelancing. If you are somebody who is planning to freelance on the side of their full-time job, their P-A-Y-E in the UK job, you need to make sure that you legally can. Yes, this is one of the adult facts I was furious about when I became a grown-up. If you're contracted for full-time hours and you are in a permanent contract, it's very likely that there will be a put a little little line uh, that basically says they own your soul. In most employment contracts there is a clause that says that you should not be working or making money in any other way. This is obviously ridiculous because lots of boomers have second houses or they sell stamps <laughs> on the side. Sorry, I'm generalizing the boomers here, I'm sorry. It's common for people to make money outside of their job, uh, but when it comes to explicitly freelancing for other companies, there may be a clause in your contract that you'll need to negotiate or ask permission for to break. Um, this is something that once I realized was there in the contract that I initially had, I negotiated with my boss, made him aware that I was doing it, told him why I was doing it, told him that I wouldn't outsource for direct competitors, um, and the ways that my freelancing added to my full-time job, like the things that I was learning outside of there, the things I'd be able to bring in, and it, there was an informal agreement between both of us that was totally fine. Most of the time it will be, but it's something to be aware of. It meant that when I went on to get another job, I was very careful about the contract. I read that clause, I explained in my employment negotiation what I was already doing outside of work, and again, explained why it was beneficial, how it had worked well in the last job. I found that if you're working for a small company, this is very easy to negotiate and just something that they simply haven't thought of because they sent you a template contract. But with bigger companies, it's actually been almost a deal breaker for me as to whether I take a job or not because they're not able to amend a contract in a very simple way to do that. I've always managed to eventually get it done. and I've never heard of any legal repercussions of that happening, but I think it's always good to get your ducks in line when it comes to legal stuff, especially if you're a small person and not the big corporate. <laughs> so that's just something that nobody told me and I wasn't aware of until I was already doing it. Excuse the sweat, halo around my head by the way, I'm just a very limp British person in more than 25 degree heat. <laughs> Number two, set your day rate and don't just have one. There's this guy whose videos I love called Guy Larson who made this incredible breakdown graph video of how to work out what you should price yourself per day. It only has a thousand views at the moment and I'm personally enraged about that because I think it's one of the best videos on the internet. But the things I have to add to that is how your day rate might change. Just having one flat day rate doesn't always make sense. It could lose you money, it could lose you opportunities, either way you might lose out. Before setting your day rate it's good to consider honestly how much experience you have in a field and the nature of the job, how much value you will be adding to the business. Also take into account whether you have worked in this specific job or in this specific role as a PAYE employee because if if you move sideways out of an industry and then start doing it freelance it's a very different conversation than coming from the bottom having never worked in that industry or role before and trying to insert yourself in an industry you don't yet know that much about. It's a very different ask for the person who's employing you, there'd be different kind of experience and trust levels there and I think you have to account for that in your pricing. When I talk about several day rates I mean there's one day rate if I am doing a job that I can just do on a simple laptop and it's more of a fulfillment role, this might be scheduling tweets, designing a banner, editing a video that's already been shot, actually doing 
the brunt of the labor. That's one fee. If I'm creating strategy for somebody or I'm training their employees so they won't need me in future, that's a different conversation. That means that there will be a higher day rate. I might choose to charge a medium or lower day rate if it's a piece of experience that I've never had before that I'd like to have. Although, like, obviously only to a certain extent, because if they are paying you, they trust you to do the job. They know you can do the job, so you should be paid for the job. Or if it's an experience that also adds something, so say I get to attend a festival or I get to do something that I would otherwise pay for, um, or it stretches me in some way, if it's a low promise for me because I'm not sure if I'll be able to deliver really, really high quality stuff, then I might consider charging my medium or lower day rate because I will be collaborating and learning alongside them. And it's good to be honest about that. I think that's absolutely fine. If you're giving somebody a bargain rate, explain to them that you're going on a journey together <laughs> and then they can take it or leave it. I charge a higher day rate if I need to use my own equipment that's expensive, say a DSLR camera or some expensive podcast mics, especially because you also need to insure those things if you're taking them off your own property, or if I need to travel a certain way and make sure that my travel expenses are covered in the quote, or they will be reimbursing me for travel expenses. <coughs> Number three, know the breakdown of your rate. And this is the same kind of like with relationships where you make a little wish list of like what you want, what it means to you. Like thinking about these things in advance is really important. Often companies will come back and question your day rate, maybe in a polite way, may, may me, maybe in a like, well, that's a bit pricey kind of way. So knowing your breakdown rate in advance causes you less stress and also makes you look way more professional you are you're a professional you can either break your day rate into what's required and days it will take you small fees for file storage and equipment use the licensing of space or music or video clips and also taking into account where it will be used for example when i'm writing something that i know will be used for internal use only within a company i'll charge a slightly less rate if i'm writing something that i know will be used in an advert or used to promote the company in some way that's a different fee or when you break down your fee you can break it down as a package and things that they could do without or do with so if they come back and they say look we don't have the budget for that but we do have this budget you can make a plan to reduce the rate that you're charging them but also reduce the service an example of this might be i won't be able to write the whole strategy for the campaign but i will be able to write you one week template brief that you can then use yourselves i will be able to chair that event but for the fee, I won't be able to have time to fully research the person that I'm interviewing and read all of their back catalogue books. So I'll need a thorough brief produced for me and a ready set of questions that you'd like me to use as a basis when I'm on stage. So then it's up to them to find the labour from within their company to do those things for you because they can't afford to pay for those things to be done. That's how you work within a budget and the person that's emailing you is in fact being paid. <laughs> that's what, the thing that can be frustrating about freelancing is that the people are telling you there isn't a budget for a project are people that are being paid full time to work on said project. <laughs> so some people are being paid and that's interesting. <laughs> I also would again just question within the industry like if for the, are they going to Pret and just asking for free sandwiches? Are they getting in taxis and asking them to drive them places for free? There's lots of like other questions around labour there that are very interesting when it comes to being a creative and not being paid. But anyway, getting steamy about that and not interested in whining about that right now. I'm interested in how to have healthy relationships with the people you do work for and being able to explain and implicitly train them uh, to understand uh, what having a low budget means. It means less service and that's fine. However, as a tag on to that advice, I would also say very strongly to make them aware of that at the beginning. The worst thing you can do is think, oh, it's not a very good rate, but I'll take it anyway and I'll just do a bodge job. Because one, that's really bad for your portfolio, it's bad for your reputation and it's confusing for them as the customer. They're way less likely to come back and ask you for more work if you do a bodge job of it or you just like half ass it. So it's better to be upfront about what's possible within their budget so that you can be proud of yourself and you can honestly give them what they were expecting. <laughs> Number four, add escalators in to your quote for edits or changes outside of their initial brief. So in a, invariably people will come back and ask you for more than you've quoted for. So to have that already agreed beforehand is really good and it often will make people write a more thorough brief because they know that there's a financial implication if they don't get it right or they need something different. For example, for podcast editing, I usually allow for two rounds of edits and I explicitly tell them that so that if they have a third round and it's not something that I've done wrong, I can be like, that's cool, but this is that agreed price we said. And they'll usually be like, yeah, sure, that's fine. We were aware of that. Being able to avoid any friction here is chef kiss the dream the way you make that happen is often reading through the brief as soon as they send it through and ask them questions make sure it's genuinely what they want think of anything they might have missed or anything they might specifically have a preference on and make sure it's all solid before you start work 
Number five, always reply within 24 hours, even if it's a no. Thank them and encourage them to keep you in mind for the next project. If it's a no because the project isn't right for you, remember to explain exactly the kind of projects or skills that you have. And if it's a time thing, get explicit about when you will next be free and what the windows of booking are for you in the future. It means when they're searching through a graveyard of emails in a panic uh, in a few months, so it won't have to go through the rigmarole of contacting you and seeing if you reply and think, oh, maybe that'll take too long, I won't bother emailing them. Giving them the information in their inbox for future reference is again, the goal. That's the ruby, get it. Number six, know in advance what you will do unpaid. I'm not somebody who would say blanket, never do anything unpaid. Sometimes doing things for people of a similar size to you that are working on small scale projects is literally your training. That's how you learn to do stuff. A lot of the stuff you won't have been taught in formal training or university. But if you are in any way privileged, make sure that those small favors and small projects aren't affecting a bigger structural issue with the industry that you work in. I would recommend budgeting for accepting very small amounts of unpaid work at the very beginning of your career, especially if you're identity has some kind of position of privilege and you're able to use that free labor to help somebody who isn't in that identity position of privilege, if that makes sense. Don't work for the big guys for free, basically. But you can learn a lot from helping independent companies or grassroots projects. I really wish I hadn't taken on so much unpaid stuff uh, at the beginning, mainly because I couldn't afford to. At times it put me in a silly financial place or it put me in a silly, silly mental health place. Both places we don't want to go. So it's important to be able to assess within yourself and honestly whether you're punching up, you're punching down, or you're literally just punching yourself in the face. The kudos of having worked with a brand is worth it sometimes, but bear in mind, to be able to say that you've worked with a brand, you only need to do it once and it should be on your terms. Make sure you set time and energy boundaries, especially if you're sharing your experience, your contacts, or your raw work, like stuff you're actually like making for them. Not every company or project is the man, but if you do have privilege, make sure you're not using it to set a bad status quo for the next person that comes after you. And make sure the people that you are essentially volunteering for know that you're only able to do it because of a very specific set of circumstances that aren't ideal or accessible to everybody. Also, if you do work for free, it's totally okay and should be expected that you ask for a reference afterwards. Ask for like just a nice little sentence about what you did so you can use it on your website and you can put it on your CV. Also have a measurable bit of learning in your head. What would you like to learn during this project or thing that you're doing for somebody? What information or experience would you like to come out with? Make sure you get that and make sure that you explain to them that that's why you're doing it for free so that they know that they owe something to you as well. Number seven, have boundaries and practice explaining them. Once you know and you can explain it eloquently, it takes a lot of the emotional burden off you, makes you way less of an angry person and often gives a chance for the person you're interacting with to learn because a lot of the time you'll be interacting with people that may be the same age as you, they might even be younger than you and they just sometimes don't know or don't have the words to explain it and if you give them a really good explanation they can forward that to their boss and then their boss will learn. So for example if people do ask you to work unpaid and you are either unwilling or unable to, both of which we should normalize, it's worth subtly and kindly explaining why. One of the things I say is that I've allotted a certain amount of time within my week or in my month to work for free for non-profits or charitable organizations. That time in my calendar has already been booked up and therefore I'm not free to do your for-profit project as an unpaid person. In the arts, there is a little bit of a feeling of like, oh, we're all just pulling each other up by our bootstraps. And it's sometimes hard for employees to remember that they are working for a for-profit company. It's a subtle but necessary reminder that it's often not that they can't afford to pay people, it's that they have failed to correctly budget for the people power they require to make the project possible. Or they have incorrectly scaled their idea based on the assumptions, not promises, of free labour. That's on them, it's often through ignorance and not evil, I hope, but it's not to do with you, it's not your fault, you shouldn't feel bad about it, and you should feel unapologetic about calmly explaining that to them. Number eight, express your lower rates as a percentage. If you do end up doing something for free or you do it for less than you'd ideally like to charge or your standard possible I can live off this fairly day rate, express that in a percentage to yourself in your own heart, mind, body, but also in the invoice. It's good to remind people, especially if they want to work with you again, that that fee that you have charged them today is not 
going to be solidified in their brains as your fee but as a special discount if you do that they won't be as confused when you come back again with your actual day rate next time they talk to you it's not that your fee is higher this time round it's that the first time you work with them you gave them a discount you can literally put this on your invoice you can literally be like one day's work on this project 200 pounds and then you can literally cross it out in the invoice and then write discount applied 25 percent and then write 150 i recently learned this is actually very useful genuinely useful for people who are charities or have kind of startup projects because they can use that as legitimate legal paperwork when they do go to apply for more funding. So giving people a paper trail of what it really costs to do something can actually be invaluable for people who are trying to do a good thing and literally do not have the money. You can even do this and, you know, it, depending on how well you know the company or the charity, you can do this and actually give them the invoice and give them a 100% discount and write free just so that they've then got the paperwork to go back again. And I think it would be great to remind them at the end of their interaction that it would be great to hear if they do get funding next time or they apply for funding or ask them if they're applying for funding since they couldn't fund it this time. Give them permission to use your invoice. Be like, that's cool, thank you for working with me. Feel free to use this attached invoice with discount on it for future funding applications. Would love to hear what you've got in the works. <laughs> Now this one was a big one for me and something I've only just really started doing. You don't need to wait till the end of a project to be paid for it. If it's a large job that requires a large time investment from you or you need to buy materials in advance, consider asking for a percentage upfront, 50% for instance, and then it's not just you harboring the financial risk if this arrangement doesn't work out. It may or may not be normal depending on the industry you're in, but I've never had that as a shock. Nobody's ever been shocked when I have done that and I can't believe I haven't been doing it for most of my freelance life. And I think it is a really reasonable request. Or if it's an ongoing project over a couple of months or even a couple of years, make them aware of how often you will be invoicing them, whether that's every month, every two months, just make them aware that when you agree the total fee, that this is the increments in which you will be invoicing. Number 10, get your invoice template right. Ask people that you know, ask your peers to see their invoices. If you work at a company, if you work at a company that employs freelancers, it's very easy to get access to, and also just for a learning thing, to go and look at a freelancer's invoice, see what it looks like, see what it includes. The thing that I didn't realize I should be putting on the end of it for years was this sentence, payment due within 30 days of issue. Because if you don't put that there, you can't really hold them to account for paying you within 30 days. You can also add percentage terms for late payment, but that will depend on your country and the laws in it. So I'm not going to give specific advice out about that because I don't want to get it wrong. But just telling you that that is a possibility that you can actually just put on the invoice how much you will be charging percent wise if it is more than 30 days. And I'm also not saying it has to be 30 days. Maybe in your industry, the norm is 60 days. Maybe it's two weeks, but explicitly putting it in there is obvious, and yet not. Number 11, do not freak out if you are not paid exactly on time. There is a lot of problems in uh, various different industries for not paying freelancers on time, and it's not always companies being evil. A lot of the time, to bear in mind, the people who are dealing with the invoices are often not the big head honcho, the person who may have an evil plan to take down the world and take down all the socialist liberal freelancers within it. Invoices are often dealt with by junior members of staff or staff that are either genuinely a little bit scatty or actually completely overstretched and also being treated like rubbish. So don't philosophically lose hope in all humanity if your invoice isn't paid on time. However, if it needs to be paid on time, that would be only fair. If you are depending on your freelance work for part or all of your income, it's worth keeping between two and six months worth of minimum what can I afford to live on money in the bank before as a buffer just because people can be shit. It's not ideal, it's not the way it should be, but it is reality and I don't want you to get caught on the wrong end of it. So it's just something to be aware of. I am not a full-time freelancer and I still work a part-time job. And one of the reasons is, is because I have to be realistic about the financial implications of working full-time as a freelancer and not being paid and making sure that I have that solid thing in place. To avoid late payment, there are two things you need to do when you send your invoice. And these are golden, golden. One, ask if they need a PO number. I don't know what PO stands for, but so many companies need a PO number put explicitly in your, sewed into your invoice, 
for it to be paid. Often people will forget to tell you that and then you'll have to start the process all over again when you remind them that it's late. Ditto with the second thing you need to ask, is the company address on this invoice correct? Could you check? <sighs> they're the two major technical things that can stop an invoice being processed and they're probably the reason that you haven't been paid yet. Yes, they should be checking it, but no, you can't trust them too. Also consider not just being like 30 days, but explicitly in the body of your email, putting the actual due date that the payment is due on. And even if you're feeling feisty, putting it in the subject line of your email. Literally the email could be called invoice 21710 due on the 12th of the 5th, 2010. Although I would not recommend writing invoices to the past, especially in 2010. That was not a good year for finance either, no. <laughs> Number 12, always follow up with a thank you. Please, thank you and sorry. Magical, magical sounds. Changing people from piggies. Humans and horses and hounds. Don't be an animal. <laughs> thank people. If you are the freelancer and you're working for a company, always make sure you have the last word and the word should be thank you. If it's been meaningful or a long-term project or it's somebody you definitely wanna work with again, you can even send them a little handwritten note in the post. It's lovely, do it. It also means that if somebody searches for your name in their inbox in months to come, in years to come, the first email they'll see from you is a polite, nice, thank you, remember those good times we had together kind of email instead of something formal and boring. <laughs> And number 13, the last one. Peers aren't given, they are made. Not the Morgan kind, the nice community kind. When you're allocating how much time you spend on freelance work, actually factor this into the time that it will take you to become a freelancer and make room for it. It's important, it takes time. Having peers is the reason that I know any of the things in this video. And it's usually taken me being over assertive and a little bit keen to make it happen. Some tips for having good peer to peer freelancer relationships is make sure you have something to give and aren't just asking questions. Don't feel too much imposter syndrome about this. It doesn't need to be anything like really big that you can give. Sometimes it's just that you read the industry news and the stuff that's happening around the industry you're working in. So you can offer helpful information to the people you're asking things of. Um, or be the person that knows the most up-to-date news about a company or an issue that's happening or you're the person that can direct them to somebody that does that thing, a project that's happening, an initiative that's open. That's free, it doesn't take much time and it's a good thing to factor into your overall like health as a freelancer. When you have peers, be really honest about money, create a culture of honesty around money. It's so healthy, it's so good. And it also prevents you from being screwed over collectively. It means that people can't bounce between similar freelancers and undermine like a realistic amount of money so you need to pay someone for them to live by bouncing similar freelancers off each other and get, trying to get the cheapest one bartered down. Run project ideas by them. Run little emails by them that you're nervous to send and you don't know if they sound too formal or too aggressive or what do they sound like, I don't know. And then just get your get your peers to be like, send the email or maybe add this in. Create a sense of confidentiality and trust between you. Pass jobs onto them that you don't think that you're completely qualified for and they will pass ones onto you. Recently, I've literally been like, I know what you're asking for and I can do it, but I actually have a friend that can do it better, but I still want to do these kind of projects and these are the ones I'm good at, so do come to me for those. And it's worked, it means that companies have genuinely come to me for the things that I am genuinely good at. And that's created trust between me and the company as well as me and my peer, because I've been honest about my abilities and it means that that company is way more likely to come to me for the things I'm genuinely good at, rather than bodging a job that my mate could have got paid for. Take a critical note of who appears in your peer group naturally and question if there are any biases or privileges going on there. Perhaps you all met at a school that is expensive. Perhaps you all met at a club that not everybody can afford to go to. Perhaps there's a real lack of diversity within your freelancer peer group and that's an issue that reflects the wider industry. How can you change that? How can you make people who have been pushed to the fringes feel included? Whether that feels natural or not isn't always the appropriate question to ask or actually brings up a lot more questions. In a time before lockdown, there were a group of us who all kind of 
uh, met at different people's houses and cooked food for each other with the explicit intent of swapping stories and workshopping problems as freelancers. It was really nice to do it in a group because it didn't create like some kind of parasocial intense one-to-ones and it also made it easier to include people that we might not know as well but, but thought could either the benefit or bring something different to the table. It's also better for people with anxiety because they don't have to talk all the time if you're just networking one-to-one -one, it can be quite intimidating so creating a group environment where that kind of chat can happen is really nice and you can also get more than one opinion on a professional problem you might be having. I understand that it is probably very hard to find peers while in lockdown but it's good to plan for the future. It's also why I'm creating a video like this because I know that those things often come from natural in-person interactions that just what is happening is can't happen right now. But you could also think of lockdown as an opportunity to um, do some international peer chats and try and find people who freelance and do your stuff in other countries because if you're zooming somebody from the next street over or the next country over at this point, it doesn't really matter, does it? I also think that people have a lot more time on their hands. They might be seriously keen on connecting with somebody new um, and chatting about what you do. I don't know. I'm just a sweaty girl in a Beatrix Potter top. <laughs> I was able to provide what is essentially some training and some knowledge for free uh, because of the lovely support of the Gumption Club members. If you would like to be in this lovely group um, of people who make these videos possible, you can find out more about my Patreon, the Gumption Club, in the link below. I have also created some other professional videos. So there's um, a playlist here of videos I made about specifically working in the publishing industry. I made a video on how to network and I probably made some other videos about careers that I'll like land around here if you need them. I hope you found this helpful and until next time, Frogsnog out.